We come to that portion of our service where we have the privilege and the opportunity to bring our praises and our requests to our Heavenly Father. So let us go to him in prayer. Gracious Father, over the past few weeks, we have been meditating perhaps a little more than usual as we thought about Psalm 8 and now have begun in the book of Genesis, how you are our God creator. It does not take long for us to think of the greatness of space, of planets and stars and galaxies and solar systems, and we are quickly come to the limits of our finite mind. And yet, with just a word, you brought it all into existence. It does not take us long for us to think of the intricacies of our bodies, to see the workings of our cells, and to realize all of it is by your wisdom. We do not even draw our next breath, but by your grace. For you have not only created all things, but it is by your power that you sustain all things. And so I pray, Father, that as we do study your word and see the greatness of your majesty, that we would never stop or cease to be in awe of who you are. Let us extol as best we can, though hindered in our words, who you are, your greatness, that you are eternal. Last week we were reminded that you can't even stop loving us because you never started, because there is no time. This is a, a comfort to us, Father, that you are outside the bounds which you created. And yet, you stoop into time and to space to accomplish your purposes for your glory and for our good. And that even is great comfort to us because you are not just a great eternal God who is distant and far off, but you are El Roy-E. You are the God who sees us. You know us. You know our frame. You know our weaknesses. You know that there are some of us who are grieving. The Tolanans and the Philips and the Elysians. Those are some of us who are dealing with health issues with Emma and Nabil, Sally and Hannah, Mark and Ruth. Some of us struggle with mental illness. Some of us have the ongoing labor of being a caregiver. Some of us are single and want to be married. Some of us are widowed and are lonely. Some of us are looking for work. Some of us are newly married and the challenges that come there. And some of us desire children. And so far you have said no. But you are the God who sees. And you do not bring us into these trials, but be for our good, that you might draw us more into yourself, that you might mold us more into the image of of your son, Christ. Your word tells us as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For you know our frame, and you are mindful that we are dust. And so we pray, Father, that we would faithfully endure not just get through the trial, not just get to the end, but that we would faithfully persevere. And you have even given us means of grace 
in these times. You have given us your word. You have given us the sacraments. You have given us prayer. And so we pray, Father, that we would be faithful in these things as we wait on the Lord. And we pray even that you would help us to be faithful in attending these means of grace. Because all all too often when we're hurting, when we're sick, when we don't feel well, when we're frustrated, when we're angry, the first thing we want to do is draw away. But where we need to be most is here, among your people, at your table, hearing your word. So I pray, Father, that you would help us in our weakness. We pray, Father, for the preaching of the word as we begin this new study in Genesis. And I hope that we will see afresh, perhaps very familiar portions of scripture, that we would see afresh you and your beauty and your greatness, how things began. I pray, Father, for the broader church, our churches here in Michigan, Ontario, Presbytery, as well as the denomination and around the world. Father, we pray for churches to be faithful in the preaching of the word and the administering of sacraments. Do not let the church go after shiny things of this world, but rather let us be faithful to the simple things that you have given us. And trust that you will work your purposes in and through them. And so, Father, as we come now to the reading of the portion of Scripture that will serve as the meditation for the message today, I pray that you would open our eyes to see you more clearly, that you would give us soft hearts and sharp minds and listening ears. And that your Holy Spirit might work its purposes in our lives, not just now, but throughout the week and into eternity. For it's in Christ's name that we pray and believe all these things. Amen. Pastor Harrison will now come and read to us our portion of scripture, Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. And you can be looking for that as he comes. Um, accompaniment to that song we just sang. I think it always strikes me when we sing that. Um, every, every time I've considered that song, um, I think we think it's a lament when we say, uh, I mean, at least the way that we tend to think about it, we, we start to believe it's a lament to say, all I have is Christ. Everything else has been taken away. That's all I have left. How good a reminder that song is. It's a praise. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. What else would we want? After all. Let's stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. This is God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse. 
in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening And there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser night to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. To rule over the day and over the night and separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said... Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. 
So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may it be preached for you. You may be seated. And as we come to this portion of Holy Scripture, let us pray for God's help. Almighty God, we do come to what is for many of us familiar territory, and we ask that as we consider it once again, that you would bring fresh insight from it to, to enliven our hearts, to encourage us as we walk with you, to further us in our discipleship. And as we have considered already throughout our service this morning, would you show us plainly how beautiful you are and what that means as we consider you and the things that you have made? Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word to bring forth fruit in our hearts that we might love you more, that we might serve you better. We ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. When I think of uh, perhaps the two most premier works of machinery, well, two instances jump to my mind. They're very different. Uh, in some ways, but in other ways, they exemplify top-notch work. And I, I tend to think of German trains and Italian sports cars, right? The, now, they're the same, and they, they exemplify the, the finest work of their kinds. They are, they are different in that for a German train, you could set your watch by its efficiency. It works pristinely. And that's what it's known for. And on the other hand, although an Italian sports car it might you know, rival that kind of efficiency, well, it's also beautiful. And so both of these things work incredibly well. But only one of them is really worth letting your eyes simply look at it. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, reminding us that God brought the universe into existence out of nothing, using only his word, and teaching us that God is fundamentally distinct from the creation. Genesis 1.2 then reads, Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So as we we shift to verse 2, I mean, really, the last time, the furthest we got was verse 1, right? And as we shift to verse 2, the focus changes, redirects from everything in the universe that God had made to the earth specifically and the first condition in which we find the earth. And then the rest of the creation narrative in chapter 1 is about God refashioning that first condition in which we find the earth. When we think carefully about these events we come to find that God did not simply make earth a place that just works like a German train. But it's also a place that's beautiful like an Italian sports car. Genesis is a book about our communion with God. And that takes different, I mean, it expresses that reality in different ways across a long book. But in Genesis 1 and 2, we're concentrated on how God created us for communion with him. He made us for that fellowship. And as we think about the way that he made creation, we see that our life of discipleship should be informed by 
how God made the world, not simply so that it would function at a meager level. Rather, everything was ordered so that we would recognize our fellowship with him as beautiful. In that manner, God's work of making a beautiful creation has profound relevance for the way that we live in the world. As soon as we acknowledge, as we have to, that God didn't need creation, he was fine without us. As soon as we acknowledge that God didn't need creation, we realize that all of creation is excessive. It's God doing what he wanted to do to show us something extra about himself. To put it in kind of the the negative way, God isn't a pragmatist. He's not interested in what he just needs. He's interested in things that are good, in things that he likes. He's an artist. And so God cares about what is true, good, And beautiful. And our main point today is that God made us for beautiful communion with Him. God made us for beautiful communion with Him. And our three points are God's goodness, God's generosity, and God's gifts. And so, first, let's think together about God's goodness. As as you think about Genesis 1 unfolding, Uh, Well, the sweep of beginning to end is that God pushes creation from what it was towards something beautiful. God did not forge a simply functional earth, but made a wonderful earth. And we see this progression even as verse 2 marks several issues about the earth, which God then handles which he addresses. Primarily, we have, we have this kind of blanket signal uh, that the earth was formless and void. So it, it didn't have shape and it was empty. Okay, and this situation, really, when, when we watch it, dominates the Genesis 1 narrative. And on top of that kind of Twofold issue, formless and void. No light illumines the world, and deep waters kept the earth from being properly inhabitable. Now, we don't know explicitly, you know, from the text whether these primeval waters covered every single square inch of earth's surface, or, or that may have been. But certainly it's clear that these waters excluded a clear distinction between land and sea. That much is obvious. And that role of the deep waters over which God the Spirit hovers like a bird spotlights that two-pronged issue that the earth was formless and void or, or empty. It's easy to rush past that little phrase, formless and void, partly because it's familiar, partly because we don't reckon with, well, what does it have to do with the rest of the narrative that earth was, at first, shapeless and empty? But beginning in verse 3, this is exactly the problem that God tackles. On day one, I mean, just to summarize so that we can have the material kind of in front of us. On day one, God distinguishes light and darkness, day and night. On day two, God made an expanse to separate upper and lower waters. Now, now that one might sound, I'm going to pause for just one second because that one might sound weird. Um, but that expanse is simply the, the sky or, or the atmospheric layer around the earth. I mean, Psalm 19.1, I mean, there's some, there's some interesting attempts to explain this, but, but when, you, when you look at kind of how these things play out across Scripture, Psalm 19.1 says 
the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And that Hebrew word there for translated sky in Psalm 19.1 is the same word from Genesis 1.3. So Psalm 19.1 says that that expanse is still there um, to get in front of some more fantastic ways of explaining that. Uh, as Reformation era and modern scholars conclude, the sky divides the waters on earth from the clouds, which are floating waters, as even the ancients knew. And on day three, God separated land and sea and covered the land with vegetation. He gave it decoration, right? Now, the point is, to to kind of grab hold of that, we've, we've thrown the details out there. In days one to three, if you pay attention, God tackled the problem that the earth was formless. What, what happened in these three days? He gave it form. He shaped it. You now I've kind of given away, so what, ha- what do you think happens next? Well, in day four, God filled the sky and the sea. I mean, sorry, he, yeah, he filled, he filled the sky with sun, moon, and stars. On day five, he filled the sea And the sky with fish and birds. And on day six, he filled the land with animals and humanity made in his image. And so we just see a very kind of, in some ways, straightforward point that whereas God addressed the issue in day one to three of the earth being formless by making earth into an inhabitable place. Well, in days four to six, he addressed the issue of the earth being void of it being empty by filling it with creatures to inhabit it. And so the creation narrative shows God bringing the world from something unusable and unattractive to something thriving and beautiful. And so the creation events show us that God made progress in developing the world. But we can go further than that. Even when when God finished giving the world form, he declared in verses 4, 10, and 12 that what he had done was good. And he repeated that declaration in verses 18, 20, and 25, culminating in the in the very good of verse 31. So God wanted the world to be beautiful by being formed, by being filled, and by being good. And he made it that way. Now we often understand that, that declaration of goodness in a, in a moral, as a moral assessment, which is true. You know, I don't think we have to discard that. But, but I think these statements also show more than that. That God approved of the value and approved of the beauty of his work. And we see, though, how, how many things God made. He's not stingy. He fills the world with tons of stuff. God found it good that creation was no longer barren, was no longer ugly, craggy, watery, nothingness, uninhabitable, and even unseen. And so when God worked to form and fill the world with good things, He made sure they were beautiful. And when we think about that, that he did all of this to make make the world as it is so that it would be beautiful, isn't it also amazing that God made light so that 
we could see the world? I mean, think about it. God doesn't need light to perceive the creation. He'd have known it just as well if it was completely dark. But we would need light to see it. And so God was good to make light so that we could see. Not only, not only the picturesque panoramas of ocean fronts or mountain ranges, but God is good in how many different colors he has made. I just think God, God did not have to make so many different shades just of green. But he has. And even though he has, he still did not have to make the human eye full of rods and cones so that we could perceive those many different shades. But God is rich in his goodness. He is not stingy. He is abundant. God's goodness is seen in how he created beauty and made us so that we could appreciate it. And that brings us to our second point, God's generosity. God's generosity. So as God reworked the world so that Earth's first initial disordered condition became the flourishing system uh, with all its grandeur that we know today, God's goodness was seen in how richly he ordered our world to work and to be beautiful. And the colors built into creation show I mean, as we've already considered, though that alone shows God's generosity to his creatures. He gave us more than was just the minimum that we would need. And we can enjoy what God made and, and know how abundantly our and giving our God is by the things that we've received. And in that, we see how, how God isn't concerned with mere functionality but also with beauty God is generous because he made creation to have more than we need take an orange for example just think about an orange God could have made oranges edible and nourishing as they are But he didn't have to make them taste like anything. But God made this fruit to bestow vitamin C and be pleasing to the taste. Or pick whichever fruit you like. Even then, God could have made nourishing and tasty oranges, but they could have been gray. They didn't have to be pleasing to the eye. But God has made orange trees so that they would be dotted with blips of color that deepen the richness of our experience of the material world that he has made. God could have made plain oatmeal as our only source of nourishment. How generous our God that we have fruit, meat, peanuts, coffee, the list goes on and on. God's generosity in creation not only calls us to appreciate God's character for his goodness, but also prompts us to consider how that affects how we should live as those made in God's image. God's image bearers are called to reflect his generosity. 
we who are made in God's image, and especially Christians who are renewed in God's image by Christ, need to be characterized the same way by, by more characterized at least by giving than collecting. Now, here's the thing. I, I'm really not, I, I, I imagine I know everybody's mind just went, and I'm actually not limiting my thoughts to money right now. It's actually not even my first stop at the moment. Um, and I want to, because actually, to ground this in the text, I want to think about our time. I want to think about our time. Uh, God's work of creation is put in front of us as, as taking six days. Right now, now, those six days I get are a hot point of debate, but regardless of your view of their length, they, they certainly do teach us something about our discipleship. And that's where I want to pick it up. Right? Uh, Augustine, the greatest of the ancient theologians, uh, he argued in, a, in a kind of an interesting turn <laughs> that that these, these days of creation, in terms of our discussions of length, are figurative because... Now, his reason was because God didn't need six days to create everything. And he could do it instantly. And that's where Augustine landed. <laughs> that creation was instantaneous. All this came together in one moment. Now, I don't agree with Augustine on that particular point, that... Uh, namely that the, the whole creation week was instantaneous. I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't find that persuasive. But the point that's useful that we pull out of that is that Augustine was exactly right that God did not need multiple days to do it. And so that brings us to the question, well, if God didn't need that length of time, why would he take that time? Well, I think one of the things that jumps plainly to the surface is as God used time, as God used up time to accomplish his work, it was for someone else's benefit, wasn't it? It was for us to have a place to live, to have useful things of creation, to have blessings. He, to kind of put it most pointedly, he took more time than he needed to fill creation with blessings for his creatures. He took time to fashion creation that way I think that, I, so, and that's what he did with the time. And I, and I think to get at kind of this issue of how we reflect generosity, he took time, he used up time to fashion creation that way to teach us something about using our time to bless others too. How often do we rush through helping somebody else to get back to our own affairs? How often do we resent needing to invest our efforts to make something useful for someone else or to bless another? God models in the way that he created the universe that goodness and generosity work to benefit others. And one best way to do this is, well, let's not be stingy with our time for other people. And we can do that by not being superficial in our interactions. Be generous with yourself. 
we, we live increasingly in an impersonal culture. Um, we seem to think we get to know people best by a web page that they create for us. How wild is that? And so we live in an impersonal age and it's getting worse, but God is a personal God. And so we ought to be people who share our deepest joys, our hardest struggles. We ought to be people who are honest and genuine. We ought to be generous with ourselves by giving that sort of thing to someone else. And we ought to be generous with our capacity by listening well to other people as we receive from them too. And so we ought to be ready to share your selves, ourselves, in conversation. Don't respond superficially. Let's take the deep dive into each other's lives to relate to one another. God's generosity prompts us to be more amazed at God's goodness in nature, but also to be more generous ourselves. And that brings us to our final point, God's gifts. And I think our reflections bring us to consider uh, two types of gifts, two different types of gifts. John Calvin helps us with the first by reminding us that the fundamental point of Genesis 129 is that God is the giver of all things that we need, particularly here in this case, food. Right? We, we should then be thankful at all moments for our, our very sustenance. But perhaps we should be more pointedly grateful every time we eat. Because God is good to feed us. And God is good to feed us with the things with which he feeds us. Praying blessings upon our meals is in no way an empty ritual, at least when done properly, but expresses our dependence and our appreciation for our generous God who has handed us an abundance of things to keep us going. In ancient, I mean, it, I, I think this is a, a startling point in some ways if we, if we keep this in context, in, in other ancient creation myths outside of Scripture, well, the gods of those stories created humanity to be workers who would find and prepare food for them. So in other words, those gods made humanity because they needed food. And made us to find it and make it for them. (laughs) What happens in Genesis? The true God made, made us with the plan to feed us. He fashioned us because he's the great ultimate father. Who would then provide for us too. Think how richly God has provided even in these simple things like food. I mean, in day three, God makes lots of plants, doesn't he? Not, not just in terms of quantity. I mean, I, I realize he covered the earth but, or the land. Uh, but types, think about how many different types. He's making plants that reproduce according to their kind, trees that have fruit, God gave humanity these plants to eat. God could have made one plant, wheat, or here's your oatmeal. No spices for it, no seasoning, here it is. But God has made mangoes, coconuts, asparagus, sweet potatoes. And the list of our food is even more expansive as God shows his 
generosity. I mean, if, if you go to Gulf Shores, Alabama, if you go to the shrimp basket and have a fried shrimp po' boy, you will know that God is good. <laughs> and we are supposed to enjoy God's creation. God made us from the dust of the earth, which fundamentally ties us to creation which God said is good. We cannot escape being bound to the created earth. We came from it. God fashioned us from it. Heaven is not an ultimate destiny of disembodied life. But as 1 Corinthians 15 is summarized in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. God well made us on purpose to be part of this physical world, dependent on it for so many things like oxygen from that expanse, like food that comes from the earth. And that is beautiful. But even the creation narrative points us to another gift as well. Specifically, God's supernatural provision in restoring by Christ even more blessings than we lost in Adam. We saw that creation was characterized by unformed waters and and coming through those creation waters, Adam was put in the garden, was tested, but he failed. Israel came through the waters of the Red Sea, went into the promised land, and proved faithless to the law. You know where this is going, right? Jesus came through the waters of the Jordan at his baptism, went into the wilderness to be tested, and proved faithful. Whereas Adam and Israel received the law personally and then were tested for themselves, Jesus was tested and succeeded for us. Only then explaining our responsibilities of godliness in the Sermon on the Mount, following upon what he had already secured to bless us. The law comes to the Christian in our life with God only after Jesus has fulfilled it and passed our test for us. God's work of bringing beauty to creation by drawing Adam through the first waters points to how God restores beauty in you through the work of Christ. As the waters of baptism are poured on us to symbolize how Christ washes us clean and helps us to walk in new faithfulness. Christ has, redu- has renewed what is most beautiful among creatures, the image of God itself. And he has done so in all who believe in him, so that we can reflect God's beautiful goodness once again. So we ought to believe in the God who was good in authoring creation. But we must trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, the the author, the perfecter, and the beautifier of our faith. Our God is a beautiful God, and God wanted more than a German train, He wanted something beautiful. And he has given us a functional but beautiful world to enjoy. And even more, 
our beautiful God has given us a beautiful Savior and offers the certain promise of everlasting life to all who would take hold of him by faith. Let us pray. Father God, how easily we lose track of how amazing the world is and how, and even more so, how easily we lose track of how the amazing things about the world are supposed to point us to the amazing things about you. As amazing as the world might be, well, it pales in comparison to who you are. And, you make known, and yet you make known your attributes in the things that have been made. Might we treasure up more and more always the splendid reality of who you are and what you've done? Might you help us to live in light of that reality as well? We ask it for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.